curve during the read operation, and we know that during the read, it's more sensitive to the noise, and you have the shrink, uh, shrinking butterfly curve like this. And with the scaling, then you will have smaller and smaller noise margin. Therefore, we have to deal with the reduced noise margin. And here are different approaches to increase the stability of the s cell. And we can classify that into two groups. One is to modify the supply voltage. The other one is to add more transistors to the bit cell. So you have homework to read some of those papers to understand the details of those techniques. I will skip the discussions here. And today we are going to have a new discussion. This is regarding the dynamic stability. So, so far, what we discussed is about static stability. Static means that you assume the noise is static. That means you assume the noise stays there forever. Of course, this is not true in practice. So in practice, the noise will be there for a short period of time. So we have to model it using the dynamic analysis. So here we can think the noise as a current source that injects to one of the storage nodes. So here if you assume the noise as a current source, and this current source will be there for a finite period of time. And then here we show this dynamic uh, behavior of the s cell. So here on the left-hand side, you will see the trajectory of the voltage evolution during the lowest injection. So if you assume the current source will be there for some time, then here, for example, if the V2, the N2 node voltage, start from zero, so let's say this is uh, N2, and this is zero, and this is one. So you start inject, injecting the cu current into the N2 node. The N2 node voltage will increase over time. And then this is uh, time. Meanwhile, because of the feedback, then the N1 voltage, so here we show the N1 voltage, Vn1, or V1. This is also as a function of time. But we have to rotate the x and y axis. So here the V1 body starts with VDD. And then it will drop as we, uh, as time goes by. So the N V2 increase and V1 decrease due to the noise injection here. But if the noise is withdrawn at certain point, for example, here, 200 picosecond, then if the noise is gone after 200 picosecond, then you see here the voltage for V2 will recover to original state. And then similarly for the V1, the voltage will recover to the original state. This is because of positive feedback we have in the cross-coupled inverter, as we discussed uh, before. So if you uh, trace the trajectory of the V1 and V2 voltage in this kind of butterfly curve, so here you will not have the full butterfly curve. You have, will have a dynamic trace of the voltage. So initially, you start from here, this is where your V1 is 1 and V2 is 0. And then during the noise injection, then this point will move along this trajectory until here. And then the noise is removed. Then this point will go back to original state. So this is like the trajectory of the state. And then if the noise stays for longer time, right? So here, if you, after 200 picoseconds, if the noise is still there, then the V2 will keep increasing, and then the V1 
will keep decreasing. So this will cause a state flip. That means an error in the memory cell state. In the trajectory here, you will start from here and then again. Here, because the noise will stay there for a long time, then you will basically flip the state to the other one. So from this waveform and the trajectory, you can analyze the impact of the noise. So here you see that the duration of the noise matter. And of course, the current, the amplitude of the current matters. And uh, essentially, is the charge that you dumped to the storage node matters. Because the current multiplied by the time will be the charge, right? So there will be a critical charge that this storage node can tolerate if you inject additional charges to the storage node. For example, a storage node where you store zero, then this critical charge determined by either a long noise or a high amplitude of noise. So the product, the duration and the amplitude matters. So here you can define a critical time for the flipping. So given amount of the noise current injection, and then you can define the critical time where the voltage of V2 and V1 will cross each other. And this will be your critical time. Typically it's short, given this kind of amount of noise, like hundreds of picoseconds, then you will cross this uh, flipping point. And you can define this time as the critical time. So here again, the duration will be the point where you move from here to cross this boundary. So here we can define this boundary. And according to this paper presented in ICCAT 2008, we can define a boundary called separate, separate tricks. So basically here is the, the boundary. We'll def this boundary will define the uh, stable points. So if you have the trajectory moving this point somewhere in this area, after the noise is removed, then it will always go back to the original state because of the positive feedback. But if somehow your trajectory moves the point across this boundary. And after that, even if the noise is removed, then it will move to the other stable point. So this boundary is critical to define where the stable point belong to, either this one or the other one. And then here on the left hand side, this is a symmetric S trans cell. So that means everything's perfect. You don't have mismatch between transistors. But in reality, of course, the s trans cell may suffer from the mismatch, the process variation. Therefore, the boundary may not be a straight line. So maybe something like this. And then if we consider the right operation, so the right operation is just a uh, opposite to the read noise. Why is that? Because in the right operation, we apply overland pulse. And this pulse width, Pw, is to be long enough to trigger the flipping. Because in the right operation, you want to flip the state. That means the overland pulse needs to be long enough trigger this flipping. So here, for the point to move from this stable one across this boundary, we have this 
time, we find that T cross, this is the time for the S strand cell to move from the stable point to the flipping boundary. And then here the TW needs to be larger than the T cross. Because here for the right operation, you do want to flip the state. So you have to make sure your wire lamp pulse is long enough to trigger the flipping. So this is uh, the requirement on the right pulse width. And of course, this critical time or this T cross depends on the, during the right operation, depends on the gamma ratio of the right uh, transistors that involved in the right operation. So that will be the pull up and the pass gate as we discussed earlier. Okay, so then here, then we can define the right dynamic noise margin. So here, remember, in the real operation of the S-RAN, the right operation is in the pulse mode. That means you are going to apply the word line with certain duration. So this TW is important. So you have to make sure that TW is long enough to flip the state. So here, if you compare with the static noise margin, so here we have this statement, and you can think why is that. So it says that even if the right static noise margin predicts successful right, the right can actually fail. Why is that? Because in the static noise margin, in that function, you assume that the right is static. That means the right pulse or the right bias can be there forever. But here, in reality, you operate on the pulse mode. So you have the right voltage for a short period of time. Therefore, the margin can be less than what you predict in the static analysis. So here we can have a summary on this dynamic noise margin. So for the read operation, you want the read pulse to be short. Because here we have this T cross, right? From this point to the boundary. The read, as we discussed before, is like you will open those two transistors. And then you have current flow through the pass gate to the go down. Then here you have the charge injection to the storage node where you store zero. So this is like you are going to inject the current or inject the charges to this node. And then you may trigger this trajectory. But as long as the Read pulse is short enough, shorter than the T cross. Then after that, because you close the word line, then it's like the noise is gone. Then you can recover with the original state. And then for the right operation, it's just the opposite to this assumption. In the right operation, you again open the word line for the TW duration. And now you want the TW to be long enough trigger the flipping. So this TW needs to be uh, longer than the T cross. So you want the trajectory to move this point somewhere to here, and then you can turn off the word line. Then the state will automatically flip to the other one. So you do say there is a trade-off between the TR and TW. And uh, I believe the rate modified right that skin is trying to solve the conflict between the TR and the TW in the s -run array. So here we have this uh, conclusion. Compared to dynamic noise margin, here the static noise margin is pessimistic for read and hold, but optimistic for write. 
So we need to understand why is this? Why do we say that? Because for the static analysis, right? So for the read or for the hold, you have the read current injection, or during the hold, you may have the noise current injection. But in reality, those current injection will be short period will appear for a short period of time. But here, the static noise margin assumes that they are there forever. Therefore, this is a pessimistic to estimate the margin static way. And for the write, as we discussed, so here the write operation actually rely on the pulse. But here, if you use static analysis, then you have to assume the pulse is forever, which is not true. So you may overestimate the write margin due to static weight. So any questions so far? Let me see if there's any question online. Okay, so then we see the conflict between read and write. If you think about the whole system, the read, if you want to optimize for the read, so here for the design, you may want to increase those transistors size W over L in the first couple of the latch. Especially as we discussed, you want to increase the cool down strength or drivability compared to the pass gate. So here in the read. You just want to read out the data, but you don't want to disturb the data. So that means you want to loosely couple your storage node to the external, like the bitline and bitline bar. So here you want the data still stored in the cross-coupled cross latch with weakly coupled connection to the external. So this is the read operation. And of course, then you want the read sense amplifier to be strong in large W over L. Here, this large and small respect to W over L. So you want the sense amp to be strong so you can detect the difference of those voltage difference between bit and bit and bar. So this is a read optimized system. And then during the write, you just want to opposite the design point. Just during the write, what you want to do is to flip the data. Therefore, you want the middle part to be less stable. Therefore, you use smaller W over L. And then you want the internal storage node strongly coupled to the external bit line or bit line bar. Therefore, here, the pass gate needs to be strong or let's say larger W over L. So as we discussed before, so the pass gate needs to be stronger than the go up because you want to change the data. And of course, here when you provide the data from external, you have to make those write driver to be strong enough to provide those strong VDD to internal node. So all the transistor along the drive uh, along the right path is to be strong. Then you see that for the read and write, the pass gate, one is to be smaller, one is to be larger. Therefore, we have this con conflict. And this is fundamental to the 60 S run cell. And that's why the uh, proposals like 80 S run cell, as you read in the homework, to decouple the read and the write pass. Because in the 6T cell, the read and the write pass are shared with the pass gate. So any questions here? And then I'd like to introduce the concept so called Shimu plot. The Shimu plot is widely used in industry. 
And uh, if you develop a new technology, like your seven nanometer, five nanometer, three nanometer, the first thing that the foundry will do is to fabricate an SRAM array because that will be your qualifier for that particular process. So then after you fabricate the SRAM array, then what you will do is to measure this Schumann plot. So here is varying the clock frequency with the Verlan pulse and then vary the power supply, VDD, the SRAM array. And then what you will do is to measure whether the read or write operations are successful or fail. So here you see that here the pass means the read or write function is correct. Fail means either read or write function wrong. And here we see this trade-off, and you can test the different combination of the frequency and the power supply. And here, generally, if you have like larger supply voltage and lower frequency, you will pass. <coughs> so here, you see we have different uh, design points for the SRAM cache. You can either operate at high frequency, high voltage. For example, here you can operate at VDD one volt and you run at 2 gigahertz, is the here, this point. So you can design a low power platform where you operate 1.45 volts, run at 240 megahertz. Then my question here, you will see this failure right here, this failure. So here the failure in those Point A and point B. The dominant type of failure is different. Because failure can be caused by either read failure or write failure, right? Then my question is here, let's say point A, the failure is dominated by read or write failure. Which one? Here. This failure is the read failure or write failure. Which one? Any idea? audience here, right, why, because here this is higher frequency, right, higher frequency as we discussed before, your pulse width, the TW, the word line pulse width for the right is so short, therefore you don't have enough time to flip the data when you write, so this is mostly caused by the right failure. On the other hand, this point B here, mostly read failure. This is because your VDD is so low. And as you know before, the static noise margin, even from the static noise margin point of view, the margin is so small, butterfly curve, because the VDD is so small. So here the margin so small for the read and any noise can easily disturb the read operation. So this is dominated by the read failure. All right, any questions on this one? Okay, so let's have a quick summary for the SRAN basic operation. So here the read is impacted by the zero to one disturbance. So we want to minimize that. Therefore, we have to make the pull down transistor stronger. And the right is initiated by the one to zero transition. This is what we have discussed. So right will trigger by the one to zero, not zero to one. So you will start with one to zero. Because zero to one is prevented by the read design. And then we have discussed the static analysis, static noise margin for the hold and for the read. And for the read, it's more critical because this margin is uh, reduced. And then we talk about the dynamic analysis. So here, you have to assume the noise or the read pulse finite. You have a short period of time. And then if you compare this, then the margin is underestimated in the static analysis compared to the dynamic one. And the read pulse 
is also finite. Therefore, the right margin is overestimated in the static analysis. And then here, read and write conflict with each other in 60 cell. For read, we want larger beta ratio, stronger pull down, weaker cascade. For write, we need weak pull up and stronger cascade. And a typical ratio that can work, let's say pull down over cascade, over pull up, can be like 2, 1, 1 in terms of W over L ratio. Pull down is 2, pass gate is 1, then you can satisfy the beta ratio larger than 1. And then the pass gate is 1, pull up is 1. Then still the gamma ratio is smaller than 1. This is because gamma ratio is, is uh, equals to 1, but the, the pull up is naturally weaker because it's PMOS. Even you have the same W over L, the pull up PMOS will be weaker than the pass gate and MOS. Okay, so any questions? We move on. Okay, next, we will briefly discuss the design considerations regarding the leakage. So here, the read speed, as we discussed before, mostly determined by the current that passes through the pass gate. Then, of course, the CBL times the delta V, the sense margin, divided by the current. And then the leakage, okay, here. If you analyze the S1 cell in more details during the hold operation. This is during the hold operation. You have three transistors that are leaking, and three of them you don't have the leakage. So you can do that by yourself. But if you do that, you will see that the one pull up, one pull down, and one pass gate transistor are contributing the leakage current. Remember, what is the definition of the leakage current? Or let's say the IO, the off-state current of the transistor. You have to look for the transistor where you have this kind of bias condition. So this is during the hold mode. Hold mode, you know, WL is zero. And then you have the VDD here. And the BSAN and BSAN bar will also be VDD. You pre-charge right, before you turn on the word line. So you can do that by yourself. I will not uh, do it for you. But you will look for the transistor where you have this kind of bias condition for the I off. That is the gate zero. And then you have source and drain bias. Therefore, here you have I off. This is a subthreshold current as we discussed before in the previous uh, section. Uh, so we have the I log scale current versus the VGS. Then we have this I off here. This is non-zero. So you have three transistors uh, that suffer from the leakage. So how do we reduce the leakage? Because this is a major power consumption today, actually, for no power platform like your smartphone. Most of your power during the sleep mode are consumed by the S1 cache leakage. So that's why your battery is draining over time, even you don't run any apps. So this is due to the S1 leakage. And then how do we deal with that? So here we have some proposals. Uh, this is uh, proposed by those papers here. So what we can do is to reduce the electric field or relax the electric field between the terminals of the transistor, like a gate, uh, let's say the, the drain to the source, or the gate to the drain or gate to the source. 
because here, as we discussed in the previous slide, so this I off is because of the VDS. This is D, this is S. The VDS is non zero. That causes I off. And if we can reduce the VTS, we will reduce the I off. This is a subthreshold leakage. And uh, also, we have another leakage mechanism of the transistor. That is called the Guido effect. So it's here. So it's called GIDL, gate induced strain leakage. So this will happen when you have a negative for the MOS, when you have the negative VGS or VDS, or, sorry, VGS or VGD. So basically, your gate has no more potential than source or than the drain. You will trigger the needle effect. And in the IDVG plot, you will see like something like this. So typically people don't show this part because normally you will not have VGS negative, the normal transistor. But if your VGS is negative, then you will increase the leakage current through the drain. So this is due to the band-to-band -band pyramid. I will not go into the details of the device physics. But here this is the Guido. And we will go back to the Guido more. I think some of the like the uh discussions in the land flash we have to deal with the Guido effect. But anyway, so here this is the, the leakage caused by the Guido. And you remember this is caused by VGS less than zero or VGD less than zero. You have a negative potential between the gate to the source or the gate to the drain. And you will have that in the s cell because you can look at the bias conditions here during the whole operation. So this is whole operation, so it's where line is zero. And here in this example, the VDD is 1.5 volts. So here you will have the storage node, right? This is store zero, this stores one. One means 1.5 volts, digital one. So here for those transistors, uh, first of all, you will have the sub-threshold current that is uh, by the gray arrow. For example, here for this pull-down transistor, here you have 1.5 volt here and the ground here. So you have VDS equals to 1.5 volt. But the gate is controlled by this storage node zero. Therefore, this transistor is exactly in the this mode, right? In this mode. And similarly, you can look at the other pass gate here. This transistor pass gate is in that mode. And then this pull up is in that mode. So this is uh, the sub threshold leakage. And then the Guido current may also occur on this transistor. Why is that? The trans transistor's gate is zero, right? We're lying zero during the whole uh, standby mode. And then here you have the source 1.5 volt drain, also like bit line 1.5 volt. So the VGS and VGD are all negative 1.5 volts. Therefore, you have the Guido current, like those red arrow showing here. I will not analyze each transistor. You can do that by yourself. And here also we have a gate parallel leakage. That means the current goes through the gate, like the IG, the gate current. But this is uh, no longer a big issue in today's high metal gate technology because that is to basically reduce the gate parallel current. So this one can be ignored for today's transistor. But it was a problem before before we switched to the high metal gate technology. The silicon dioxide is so thin. Therefore, if you have large gate voltage, then you may have the direct parallel gate. Then we switch to the high metal gate. Then the physical thickness dielectric actually is thicker. So the gate parallel current uh, uh, minimized. But still, the Guido and the sub threshold leakage are present in today's transistor, I mean, today's S1 design. 
So one way to reduce that is to relax the field. Basically, you want to relax the VDS, VGS, VGD. You want to reduce the voltage across those terminals. So what you can do is to change the bias during the standby mode. So here, you want to raise the uh, VSS. Used to be ground, but during the hold mode, standby mode, in this example, you can increase to 0.5 volts. And also for the P-time, P-time bar, you can reduce that to 1 volt in this example, from the original 1.5 volts. So if you do that, you can check all the bias between those terminals will be reduced. For example, here, we used to have this uh, gray arrow here, this I off. So now this will become 1.5 volts and uh, then one volt, let's say. So still we have that one, um, but here, let, let, let's look at the Guido first. Look at the Guido first. So here this is one point, uh, this is zero volt, and then this is one volt. So here this voltage difference reduced to one volt. Originally is uh, 1.5 volts. Right, so you see the electric field is relaxed between those two terminals. And also for this one, for this VDS, this is 1.5 volts. Now the S is 0.5 volts. So the voltage across the drain to source is one volt. And the previously is 1.5 volts. So basically you can do that analysis by yourself and you will see that all the voltage bias across those terminals will reduce in this skin. Therefore, you can reduce the leakage. Remember, here, this leakage current exponentially depends on the voltage across that. In this sub-threshold region, either here or here, this is in north scale. Even if you change a little bit on the voltage across that, you will see like orders of magnitude change of the current. And another skin you can use is to use this uh, boosted VDD or dual and dual threshold cell. So here the idea is very straightforward. Because we know the problem during the standby mode, that is the current flowing from the VDD to the ground through those I off. So here for the transistors in the middle, in the cross capped latch, you can use higher threshold voltage transistor. Therefore, the leakage will be reduced. Why is that? This, this is very straightforward. Right? So the I off, as we discussed, is this log scale I versus VGS. And this is uh, like your threshold voltage. If you increase your threshold voltage, right? then your current I off will exponentially decrease because the slope, the S, is similar in this, this kind of transistor. So if you increase the VT, then you will greatly reduce I off. So you can use higher VT for those cells in the course of couple of match. And therefore, if you want higher VT, then during the active operation, like the read or write, then to compensate for the higher VT, you have to in increase the VDH. So the VDD needs to be improved, I mean increased, to compensate for the higher VT. So in the active mode, you have to use a boosted VDD for the VDH here. But during the standby mode, this, this, you can lower that. And then for the pass gate, you may want to use a regular low T transistor because pass gate determines the rate of speed. If you have a larger weight T here, the trans pass gate current is not large enough, then the rate of speed will be impacted. Therefore, you want to keep the low weight T for, for the pass gate. So you can play with those uh, tricks in the transistor design for the S-RAN cell. 
And here on the right hand side, we show some of the static noise margin improvements with those schemes. Previously, uh, to reach like 100 millivolt static noise margin, if you don't use those skin, you may have to keep the minimal uh, voltage, like 0.6 volt VDD. Uh, if you use that, you can reduce the minimal VDD to 0.3 volt. So here are some ideas how to deal with the leakage problem of the s -ram. There are many ideas. Here is not an exclusive list of the schemes proposed by the researchers. There are many ways to do that. So any questions? Okay, so then let's move on to the next uh, section. This is to talk about the layout. So first, uh, let's have a review of the cell evolution. And here is the history of the SRAN cell design in the 1990s. Then sometimes the SRAN is not 6T SRAN, sometimes it's 4T SRAN, 4 transistor plus 2 resistor loads. And then after below the 250-100 nanometer load, and the 6T SRAN cell becomes the mainstream technology. And then we will talk about some of the early designs for the SRAN. So basically in the early days, uh, the, the PMOS transistor is not very widely available. So you have NMOS only technology. If you have NMOS only technology, then the, those two nodes uh, transistor can be the NMOS node. And then you can have this uh, so-called diode collected NMOS as a permanent uh, node. You can think this is a resistor node. And then the problem is that you will have the uh, static, more static uh, leakage from VDD to ground. And also the output is not real to real. It's not from VDD to ground. You will have some um, penalty on the VTH drop. So this is uh, the very early design. You don't have the PMOS. And also you can change the uh, NMOS transistor to have a negative VTH for the NMOS. So this is called the depletion node, NMOS. Similarly, you will suffer from the same issue, that the uh, output is not real to real. So this is also called ratio the logic. You have a DC dissipation. That means you have the static current always flow from the VDD to ground. And then today's 60 SRAN cell, you know, this is how it looks like. This is fully CMOS design. And then in some early days, I believe that people use those resistor as a load. So here, this again is the ratio logic and you cannot reach the full VDD. But the good thing of this one is that you can place those uh, resistor on the top interconnect. Therefore, the area can be less than 60 SRAN cell. But again, the 60 SRAN cell is the mainstream today, and you will only see that the foundry technology today. So here we talk about the contact gate pitch scaling in the previous lecture, and we discussed the contact gate pitch, or sometimes called contact poly pitch, because the gate used to be polysilicon, but of course nowadays we change to high metal gate. Historically, this is also called CPP. So you can define the CPP as the center of the contact of the source to the center of the contact of the drain. And then CPP, you know, will be the distance of the first the LG, the gate length, and then you have the spacer, and then you have the contact, like a diameter, half of the contact diameter. So here, we show the 
change of the those dimensions with the different design technology node. And the CPP, as we discussed before, keep decreasing over the generations. And then the gate length does not scale too much, as we discussed before. So what is really scaling is the CPP. To enable the CPP scaling, if you think about this one does not scale, that means what really scales is either the compact diameter or the spacing. This is called spacer, basically isolation between the source and drain contact to the gate. So those dimensions are scanning over the generations. And here we have some more details. LG shrunk only 5 nanometer during the four generations from 65 nanometer to 22 nanometer. The LG does not really scale as we discussed before. Okay, so then let's look at the representative 60S1 cell layout. This is important. And uh, here we show a very standard design. This is for the uh, planar bulk transistor before we switch to FinFET. So here, let's hope that you can understand the layout. This will be typical questions, maybe in your exam. So here, the question is, uh, first, identify where are those transistors? Where is the pull up cascade and pull down? Label that. And the second question might be, what is the cell area in terms of the F square? Because we are normalized to the design rule F. So here, let's first look at the where the transistor are located. So let me ask, where are the pull-up transistor? Any idea? You need, I hope that you will be able to read those kind of layouts after this class. So here you see this unwell. Unwell is where you you fabricate the PMOS, right? Because you need the N-type substrate for the PMOS. So here in the middle, you have the PMOS. And then the gate, in this case, is a green bar here. So this is a gate. That means here, this is a gate. So the transistor is will be somewhere like this. Another transistor here. And those two transistors will be those two PMOS in this region. So you have the gate. And you have the source and the drain. And you know for the PMOS, source is attached to the VDD and drain is here. So this, those are the two PMOS, pull up, pull up one and pull up two. And then here for this transistor, you have another transistor here. This is a MOS. And this one is the pull down or this one is cascade. Any idea? One? Pull down transistor, okay. Why? You need to create this layout to the circuit schematic, right? So circuit schematic. So this is one side of the S1. And you know the pull down and the pull up are connected. This is the inverter. So they share the same gate, right? same input. So the same gate, the green bar here, collect the pull up and the pull down together, and like this. So this is the pull down and pull down one. And then this one is a plus gate one. And then the pass gate, uh, you know, is controlled by the word line. So that's why this pass gate, pass, pass gate, gate is controlled by the word line contact. And then the bit line contact is this one. Because pass gate, the other side, controlled to the BL, right? So this is the BL. Okay, so first you identify where are the transistors. 
And second question, uh, how large is the cell area? So here, let's look at the vertical size. So you have two CPP here. What is that? Here you have two gates, right? Two green bar. And then you have the contact, VSS contact. And then this, this is a, your storage load. This contact actually is a storage load is here. Right? And then you have the bitman contact. You have two contacts, as we defined before, right? The center of the contact, the distance between the centers of the contact is one CPP, and you have here two CPP. Two gates, basically, two gates CPP. And then here, horizontally, you have five metal one pitch. So where are the metal one? So here, this, this contact will back to the metal one, right? So you have one, two, three, four, five. You have five metal one pitch. And here you have two CPP. So here are two CPP and five metal one pitch. And roughly CPP, one CPP will be 4F. And in this case, also metal one is about 4F. So first of all, CPP, 4F. Why is that? So roughly, very rough, okay. Because as we discussed before, F nowadays does not really create any physical dimensions. But roughly, if you think of a transistor, you have the contact here. So if you think this contact is half F, and the spacer is F, and the gate length is F, and this is F, and here you center, right? Then you have half F. So roughly, you have 4F here. Very rough. Okay, it's not exact one-to-one -one mapping. So roughly one CPP is 4F. And also metal one here is about 4F because here the metal one pitch is not minimal. Why is that? Here you see here, this one is not minimal. The reason is uh, you, you look at here, this transistor width. Here the pull down, where is the transistor width? So here is the length, L. Width, W, right? Here, this active region defines the width of the transistor. And you see the pull down, this W is next to, this W over L is next to. And then this pass gate, W over L is next one. You see the pass gate, the width is half of the pull down. Therefore, here from the metal one, this contact, so this contact, this is metal one pitch. This metal one pitch cannot be minimal, like 2F. In this case, it's about 4F. This metal one pitch is about 4F. And also from here, this contact to this contact, because you have to make the N well, so you need to have a spacing between the well, the distance between the well to the active region, therefore those two contacts, you cannot use 2F, you have to use 4F here. So here roughly, let's say the horizontally you have five metal one pitch, and each metal one pitch is about 4F. So here then, let's do that. Two CPP times five metal one pitch, and roughly this is 4F, and also metal one pitch is 4F, so you will get 160F squared. So this is the next eight times 20. So you get 160 F square. And this is what we discussed before in the previous lecture. I said that the S run, if you optimize well, you get like a 150, 150 or 160 F square as a lower bound. And this is a, really the lower bound because here the transistor size is almost uh, minimized. The W over L, like the pass gate, pull up are all one. If you further increase the W over L, then of course the horizontal dimension will increase. So your transistor size, I mean the S-run cell size, 
may increase to like 200 F squares or even 300 F squares. So depending on where the, the, the S rank is located in your hierarchy of the hash, right? Like level one hash, definitely you will not use this one. This is more like L3 cache, the minimal size. So any questions? I hope that you will understand this layout better now. Questions? So where is the dream of the pull down? Oh, you mean, oh, okay. So I think uh, this is, uh, we didn't show the top level interconnect. So here, for example, the word line, right? Those two word line. You, you know, uh, the, the, the word line should, should be together, right? Uh, left, left branch and right branch. So you, you will have higher metals to collect those word line. Yeah, so, so here. And this one, you, uh, 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 you don't need to really make the contact here because here this is connected, uh, connected. So here, this is the S run layout. And then here, the cell evolution. And uh, on the right hand side, this is the same as we see in the previous slide. And this is the so called the white cell because it's white. Here, this is white. And this is uh, beyond 90 nanometer, or let's say below 90 nanometer, this is the standard design. You will see SRAM always like this. But uh, before 90 nanometer, or let's say above 90 nanometer, then the design may be different. So for example, there is another design called the tall cell, because it's tall. The tall cell, the same question if I ask you, look at this layout and identify where the transistor is. Can you do that? So this is another design. It's not widely used today, but uh, used to be a popular design in the older technology nodes. So again, right, so if you look at the layout, first try to find the PMOS, and it's easy to find the PMOS because here we have this uh, n well re uh, region. So the Q3 and Q4 will be the PMOS. Q3 and Q4 will be the PMOS. So let's say those are pull up. And in this case, this polysilicon, this is a gate. And then pull up, share the same gate down to here. So this Q1 must be the pull down, right? Because pull up and pull, pull down share the same gate. And then the Q5 and Q6 here will be cascade. So you see here the orientation of the transistor will be different. So for the pull up, the transistor orientation is like this. Pull up and pull down, right? It's like this, those two transistors here. But for the pass gate, actually the polysilicon is horizontal. That means the gate is horizontal. So, so here is more like this one. So it's something like this. So the orientation, let's say the channel orientation for the pull down and pull up are vertical. And then for the pass gate, the channel is uh, Horizontal. Oh, so yes, it's horizontal. Oh, and I should do the other way. So, so here the pull up and pull down. I would say they are more like this. But the gate is vertical, share the same. The channel is horizontal. And then for the pass gate, here the gate. Is horizontal and then the the channel is vertical. So my point is that the orientation of those transistors will be different in this tall cell design, and that's why this is not preferred for today. Because for today's scaled technology, you want all the transistors have the same orientation. So all the transistors will placed horizontally, let's say, your, your channel direction. And then you use the interconnect wires to collect the transistors. You want to make, make regular patterns. This is, it is easier for fab fabrication. So 
Don't let me say any questions online. Okay, so then let's briefly talk about the fabrication challenges for the SRAM. So here, this is a summary where we switch from the tall cell to the white cell. This is because the discography patterning become a problem when we scale down below like uh, 90 nanometer. Because below 90 nanometer still, before we switch to the EUV today, all the lithography used in this 193 nanometer wavelength. This is a 193 lithography tool. And then to pattern the small features, it will be very difficult if you don't have the regular pattern. So the tall cell, as we said before, you have different orientation of the channel. Then it will become very difficult to pattern the features. So we have to evolve from this arbitrary shape to the straight lines and holes of the layout. So if you look at before here, you have even like uh, this shape of the wires, T shape. So this is not desired today. So you want all the wires, like straight line, either horizontal or vertical. And the gates are oriented in the same direction. This is preferred. And here, let me show one of the real design rule. This is, I believe, from the IBM. It's a 45 nanometer. So here, if you look at the real design rule for the s ran cell, so those are the dimensions you will have, like the distance between those contact region and then between the, the, the gate with the contact and also the n well, the, the, the distance in the, uh, between the n well and then the, the, uh, uh, p, uh, the n well and the p, p, p substrate. So all those, basically all those dimensions will be manually specified by the foundry. So you will see that typically in the foundry uh, design rule for the s ran cell, it's much more compact than what you handcraft by yourself. If you use a PDK, if you have ever used a PDK, process design kit to design the logic circuit, you will follow some design rule and you will pass the DRC check and the design rule check. But if you manually do that by yourself, then you will not get those close distance as offered by the foundry s run cell. Because the logic design, there are many rules to follow, but the foundry rule for the s run is highly optimized. So this is uh, offered to you as a package. Foundry will offer you like an s run compiler, so you will generate an s run array. Ethically, you cannot handcraft s run Of course, you can handcraft s run and make, making the connections by yourself replace this transistor and make the connections, but that SRAM will not be high-density SRAM. You can achieve the same functionality, but you will not get the same performance as what Foundry provides you. So this is the design rule for the SRAM. So then let's talk about the SRAM patterning challenges. So here we show some real images captured from the chip, just question. Logic, yes, yes. So, yeah, if you use logic, if you, if you pass, if you use this kind of design rule, it will violate your DRC. Oh, really? Yes, yes. But since the s run cell is offered to you as a package, yeah. then, then it will be fine, yeah. You can handcraft the s run cell by yourself, but then you have to maintain the distance according to the logic design rule. And if you do that, you will find out your handcrafted s run cell will be roughly like twice larger than the foundry provided one. Okay, so the s run patterning, here we show some images under the microscope. And uh, here again, 
this is from the real chip. And then here, the question for you is that, identify where the transistor is. Same question. You may say that in your homework or even in the exam. So if you, you are given this kind of picture, the identify where is the pull up, pull down, and the cascade. And so let's do the, this one. So again, this one is actually the same as the layout, like this or like this one. But this is after the fabrication. You see the real pattern under the microscope. So again, here in the middle, you will have the pull up. So you have the pull up one. So this is the transistor, right? And then here you share the same like pull down. And then this one is the pass gate. Still, it's like this. So here, this horizontal bar is this uh, square line. Oh, sorry, it's a gate of the those transistors. And here, we show two samples, and then you say the first one is not so good because the shape becomes, you know, non-standard. Right, you have the wrong ending, and this is rough. So this is not good. But this is because of the limit of the lithography. So I will briefly talk about the lithography, although I don't really introduce the fabrication in this course. But I hope that you understand in the semiconductor manufacturing, you will make the mask that relate with your layout. If you are a circuit designer, right, so you, the, your final product is the GDS file, the layout, but when the foundry gets your layout, the foundry will really make a mask that match your layout. So the mask, here you have the light source, and it typically is 193 nanometer wavelength, right? It's in the, it's uh, not visible, you know, the visible light is from 400 nanometer to around like a 900 nanometer in terms of wavelength. This is uh, 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 not visible. But anyway, so here we have lens, so you focus that, so the light will go through the pattern, and then you will transfer, this is uh, probably a stepper, so you will transfer the pattern to your actual wafer to define the photoresist uh, region, and then after the uh, exposure and the develop, you will transfer the pattern to the photoresist and use the photoresist as a hard mask to etch the metals or etch your like a polysilicon or whatever on the wafer. So here, from the basic optics, we have the resolution formula. So the res resolution of the feature on the wafer will be determined by the lambda, that is the wavelength of your light source. And then this NA is the numerical aperture of your lens, how good your lens is. So here, as a rough estimation, if you recall your, I don't know, it's a high school or college physics, so the resolution for any night is roughly half lambda, right? half of the wavelength, that's the resolution, because if, the res if your two features have become so close, then you have the, like, uh, the refraction of the light, so then your facial will become like a blurred, right? So the resolution is roughly half lambda, and if you use 193 nanometers, so roughly like your facial can be only like 90 nanometer. And below 90 nanometer, you will have those like, uh, even though your layout or mask is a perfect uh, horizontal line, but then after the patterning, you will have those ending. So there are several techniques to extend the lifetime of the 193 nanometer lithography. Actually, 193 nanometer lithography is used even today for like 10 nanometer process, or even 7 nanometer process before we switch to EUV. So here are a few techniques that we briefly discuss that. First one is called immersion lithography. This is to make the numerical aperture larger. So here, that is to make the medium from, uh, between the lens and the wafer to be, used to be air, you have the air, right? But if you make it a, like some liquid, so the, the numerical aperture will increase. So basically the refract, re refractive index 
the light in the liquid will be larger than in the air. So you can increase this parameter in the formula. Therefore, you can decrease the resolution. This is one technique. The second one is called the optical approximately fraction, OPC. So what is that? This is to predictively make your mask to compensate the errors in the lithography. So from the layout, you generate, for example, this, uh, this bar. It's a rectangle. But you know, after the lithography, due to the re uh, refraction, then you will have the round ending. So what you will do is to predictively make your mask like something like this. So your two ends will, will miss some corners. You, you design the mask like this. But after the exposure, then because this will expand a little bit, so actually you will make a more close to the perfect shape. So you predictively model the, the refraction of the light, and then you design the mask to compensate for that. So this is uh, this OPC. And then the double patterning, I will talk about that in the next slide. And then today, I think we switch to the EUV. This is a green ultraviolet isography, and it has a 30 nanometer wavelength. So, okay, from a few minutes, I will finish the double patterning. So, double patterning is a very effective technique to extend the resolution of your pattern. So, here, let's try to understand the S1 patterning. So, here we have those horizontal lines. That is the pattern in the first step. And then, in the second step, we will make some of those regions. To be cut. So we will make some mask and then expose those regions and then etch out the, the wires in those regions. So then you will make those third step. This is a final gate pattern. So here then you will have the real S1 cell layout like this. So you want to divide this into two steps. If you don't do this, okay, if you directly pattern this, if you directly pattern this feature, you can directly make the mask like this, so the step C. But then, due to the refraction, then you will have this round ending or the roughness, right? So this is because the light is very sensitive to those kind of, you know, corners. So what you want to do is always make a straight line. So you, that's why you split into two steps. The first step, you have all the long straight lines. So this will be perfect. And then you cut vertically also in some long like rectangle region. Then try to reduce the complexity of the pattern, basically. So you want each step to be simple. And then you can finally get this almost perfect patterns, as we show here from the Intel's sample. And also here, another way is to use the spacer to transfer the pattern. I will quickly go over this. So basically here we can deposit some materials as a hard mask. This will cover everywhere. So initially your lithography will define, this is the distance, for example, your 90 nanometer distance. This is what you can do, for example. And then you deposit something everywhere, and then you etch out those, etch out those regions. So only this part is left over. So this part is defined not by the lithography. This part is defined by how much you deposit on the surface. So the thickness here can be short, right? So it can be 10 nanometer, for example. Or let's say 20 nanometer. So here that means this feature will be 20 nanometer. So you use this 20 nanometer as a hard mask to further edge down the wires below that. Therefore, this, here this distance will be 20 nanometer. So here you see that although your lithography is 90 nanometer, you can get 20 nanometer feature by this kind of a double patterning. So this is a spacer technology. And this is the same technology that is the UC Berkeley group fabricated the first film fetch. 
1998. At that time, they make like 20 nanometer, you know, gate lens in university facility. It's impossible to use the lithography. This is how they transfer the pattern through the spacer down to the bottom to make a fin fat in the early days. Okay, so let me see if there's any questions. And if not, then we will stop here today. Thank you.